Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fikuma yuhibbu rabbuna wa yarda wa sallallahu ala nabiyyil Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Welcome back to our um, Ramadan series conversations from the Quran. We have now arrived at class number 13, 12. Class 12, class number 12, alhamdulillah. Class number 12. <clears throat> and we are discussing the conversation between Bilqis and uh, Prophet Suleiman. Can you um, write in the light up in here? Can, just turn the knob. Yep, perfect. Okay, so we are <clears throat> talking about the conversation between Bilqis and Prophet Sulaiman, alayhi salam. And so we stopped where al hudhuda the the hudhud, the bird, came across um, came across a, a group of people, a nation of people, and they were being ruled by a woman. And her name was Bilqis bintu Sharahil. And what the bird observed, the bird made some observations. One of the things that the bird observed was that um, this group of people was being ruled by a woman. And she had a magnificent throne. She had a huge army you know, under her command. And she had been given everything that you could possibly think, think about, think of. And she had a magnificent throne. However, the bird made another observation, and that is that she found them, uh, the bird found them prostrating to the sun. All right, they were prostration, uh, sun worshipers, you know, idolaters, uh, so to say. And the bird took offense upon seeing these people prostrate to the sun because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the bird knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one deserving of worship. And the bird uh, on surah number 27, ayah 25 and 26, the bird says, Ala yes lillah. Why don't they prostrate, right? Why don't they prostrate to Allah? Aladhi yukhriju al-khaba'a fi samawati wal ard wa ya'lamu ma tukhfuna wa ma tu'alinun. He said, why don't they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the one who is able to bring forth the seed, whether in the heavens or in the earth, and knows what you conceal and what you reveal, there's nothing deserving, deserving of worship except him, and he is the Lord of the magnificent throne. So while highlighting that this queen had a magnificent throne, the bird also, in contrast to that, highlights the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only Lord of the magnificent throne. And we talked about, you know, the different times in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade us from uh, from, from worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from prostrating or from making salah. And that is so that the times that we worship Allah does not conflict with the times uh, that people who commit shirk, the time that they worship their idols or their gods. All right. <clears throat> and we mentioned one of the lessons, we, we stopped at a, a, a lesson that I'll get to. And <clears throat> the, the lesson that we stopped at was, uh, I believe it was lesson number 16. 
Lesson number 16 was that the prophets don't know the world of the unseen. All right, because uh, after the bird gives his observation to uh, to um, Prophet Suleiman, Prophet Suleiman says to him, King's language, he said, Senamdur, asadakta am kunta min al-kadibin. I'll take a look into this affair, this queen that you're mentioning, this nation that you're mentioning. I'll go and do my own research and find out whether or not you're truthful or you're not truthful. And we said that number lesson number 16 was that prophets don't know the unseen. And number 17 is that, that a person is presumed truthful until proven otherwise, not the other way around. All right. Uh, lesson number 18, I'm going to add this here, is that kings observe and do not rush into judgment or to accept information, especially when they have the ability to investigate themselves. This is a king's language. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And I'll find out whether or not you're truthful or you're lying. This is King's language. And there, you're going to see more of Suleiman's personality as this is one of the purposes of dialogue, as we talked about at the very beginning of this course, or the very beginning of this uh, series. And that is that one of the purposes that authors use dialogue or, or conversation uh, between two people, within two characters within a story, is so that the character can reveal themselves. The more the character speaks, the more the character dialogues, the more you get to understand the, those who are in the more powerful position, those who are more inferior, you know, who's angry, who's upset, who's this, who's that. The, the character is revealing more about themselves. And so as we listen to Suleiman's language, we can hear King's language. We can hear his speech. We can see the type of character that he is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation of his conversation. All right. King's language, kings observe and do not rush to accept information when they, especially when they have the ability to do investigation for themselves. So Suleiman said, I'll, I'll look into the affair and, and I'll find out whether or not you're lying or you're telling the truth. As the same thing that with one of our children, one of our children may come to us and give us a story, give us a narration. And we say, okay, without accepting what they're saying or without rejecting it, we just say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Sometimes my children come and say, you know, Abby, can we do this or can we do that? Say, give me a minute. Let me think about it. You know, is your room clean? Did you take out the garbage? Like, you don't want to say, yeah, go ahead. And then you go in the kitchen, garbage wasn't taken out. You go upstairs or you go into their room and they never cleaned up the room, right? Especially those early teens where they forget everything. You know what I'm talking about? Those 13, 14 year olds. And they literally, you can tell them something. And within five minutes, they forgot. It's like, I, uh, I have this thing now with, with my 12 year old. I say, look at me, look, look at me here, look at me. Follow what I'm saying. I need you to go into the kitchen, take the trash out, also take the recycling and put it inside, inside the trash bin that is outside. You, you follow me? Are you understanding? He's like, yes, Abby, I, I heard you. No, no, no. because. What you'll do is you'll go in, you'll get one trash, you'll leave the, the, the recycling, and then you'll take it and you'll put it on the porch and not put it in a trash can. And then I got to call you back constantly. Hey, I thought I asked you to do this. Hey, I thought I asked you to do that. Hey, I thought I asked you to do that. So now I have this thing where I want you to look me in my face, look at me in my eyes, hear me out clearly because they be on social media, they be on their phones all the time, and they're not totally there. They're looking at you, but they don't hear you. They're not processing, they're not computing. So you got to constantly repeat yourself over and over and over. And this is a pet peeve of mine, me, myself, personally. For me, I hate repeating myself. I do, which is why I speak the way that I speak. I speak clear so that I don't have to repeat myself again. That it is, it is, it takes everything out of me for me to reiterate which is why when I post something on social media and I put a long post and I explain in such detail and then somebody comes along and, and totally misses the point, I don't even respect it. I, I did everything in my power to articulate myself in the best way that I possibly could. To me, I thought it was completely clear. Maybe it wasn't, but I am not going to engage you on social media. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. Or I post, a, I post a flyer, I put the date, I put the time, put the location, and then right underneath the comments, 
Where's the uh, event going to be at, Brother Imam? Nope. I never respond. Maybe somebody else can help you out, but I am not responding. I'm sorry. That takes a lot out of me. Not even going to respond. But, you know, we have to make sure that they, and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to repeat his words three times. From the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever he would give a command or a task, he would repeat himself three times. Sometimes in a lecture, I will say things multiple times, many times over, so that as you're listening, you'll hear it repeated over and over again. We learn through repetition, but sometimes repetition can get exhausting, especially when you're dealing with children. All right. Shout out to all of the moms out there that are raising sons by themselves at home. Trust me, I know. Man, the 12, 13, 14 year olds, man. And at 16, we hoping that they get it, starts to register. And by 18, they're on their way out. So we don't really care one way or another. We're, we're indifferent at that point. It really doesn't matter. You're on your way out anyway. So at some point you'll get it, right? So a person is presumed innocent until proven otherwise. Uh, lesson number 19, uh, King's language. Uh, the king doesn't rush to accept information, especially when they have the ability to investigate for themselves. Lesson number 20, and, then, and that is that we should honor excuses. When someone brings you an excuse, and it's a legit, we should honor that. Regardless of how you felt about the person prior to that, when the person finally brings you an excuse and it's, it's acceptable, right? It's reasonable excuse. You say to yourself, all right, it's like one of your children get in trouble in school and you come home and here, as we talked again, we're, we're breaking generational curses. So we don't just rush to judge them. We say, listen, I want to hear you out before, before I, I issue my decree. I want to hear you out. Why, why did you, you know, why did I get a call from your principal? Well, you know, this happened, that happened, and you're like, all right, I, I understand. From a kid's standpoint, I get it. I understand that's why you did it. That's That was your logic. That was, you know, boy logic. I get it. But don't you think that, you know, you could have done it this way or that way? And yeah, well, I, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it like that. You know, we accept excuses if they're legitimate. The bird presented an excuse why he didn't show up in Suleiman's court because I was over here observing this queen and her kingdom and they were worshiping the sun. So he came back, it was a legit excuse. And Suleiman accepted that. He didn't, how do we know he accepted it? Because he didn't punish. What did he say? If the bird does not come back with a legitimate excuse, I'm gonna punish it or I'm gonna slaughter it. And he didn't either, which meant that he accepted the excuse. But just because you accepted the excuse doesn't mean that you consider it valid. It just means that I accept your excuse. So instead of doing to you what I was going to do to you, I'm not because of the excuse you gave me. But now I'm going to look deeper into your excuse to find out whether or not it has some validity to it. All right. There's a lot of lessons in this. You know, we're talking about a king. And this is I'm really talking about men in the home because sometimes we can be very, you know, if we can run our homes like a dictatorship. All right, and that's not how homes should be ran. Men, we should be merciful, compassionate, especially with the people in our homes. We can afford to be that way. We, can, we may not be afforded that opportunity or that luxury to be that way outside the home. All right, because we live in a society where if you act like a sheep, you attract wolves. So we may not have that luxury to exercise that level, that degree of compassion and mercy outside the home. But in the home, you're a king. Conduct yourself accordingly. You don't have to rule with an iron fist. You're a king, conduct yourself. The child ain't going nowhere. I, I, I'll investigate, I'll look into it. I ain't gotta punish you right now on the spot. Let me think about it. Let me think about the ways in which I can punish you. I, I don't have to, you know, as Maslow's hammer theory, right? In psychology it's called Maslow's ha hammer theory. He says that, thus it stands that if you are a hammer, then you see every problem as a nail, meaning you are the type of person that solves every single problem the same way. You don't diversify your approach to problems. Every problem is solved the same exact way. Man get into an argument with his wife, get into a problem with his wife, you're, I'm, I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to put you in it. That's, that's your solution to everything. 
Every single time you get into an issue with your wife, the first words that come out of your mouth is, if the divorce, I think we need to go our separate ways. It's like, diversify your approach. What if I told you that there was another way that you could handle that? Or when it comes to sons, sometimes you know, we rule with an iron fence. We want to beat them. We want to chastise them. We want to put hands on them, lay hands on them. It doesn't have to be that way every single time. Sometimes, how about talking to him? Hey, listen, I'm going out. Go put your stuff on. I'm going to take a while. Conduct yourself like a king. This is your prince. This is your young soldier. And the only way that he's going to get these lessons is that you got to take time out to explain to him. You know, th this behavior, you know, use some empathy. Did you see the look on your mother's face? You, you know, you're killing your mother, man. You want to instill empathy in him by using the position of the mother in the, in the relation, in, in, the, in the household. The Prophet Sallallahu said that if you want Jannah, ilzim rijla umek. If you want paradise, then stick to the feet of your mother. Paradise lies at the feet of your mother in your obedience to your mother and your humility before your mother. And you're avoiding angering your mother and upsetting your mother. You want to instill those type of principles in them. Because you as a man, you, you know he ain't going to do it to you. I ain't got to worry about you disrespecting me. I have my way of dealing with you. You know, my sons, I, I can just give them a look. Fathers, we know that look. I just look at you. And when you see the look on my face, that look, this is what, what I mean when I say men understand men. Every grown adult male at some point was a boy in his life. And we know what those looks mean. When an adult male looks at you a certain way, sometimes they can see right through you and you feel that. And you know when you've angered and you've upset and you've crossed a certain line, right? We all know that. So it's important for you know a man to conduct himself. This is, you're a king. Not a king, you are a servant of the king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-malik, al-malik, he is the king. But we are representatives of the king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship him, we serve him. So therefore, we take on some of his qualities and characteristics. And you serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you take on some of his qualities and characteristics. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the traces of his blessings on his servant. And if one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings on you is knowledge of his names and attributes, then Allah wants to see that manifest on you. We are representatives of the king. So we conduct ourselves accordingly. If you hang around someone long enough, you start to take on some of their qualities and their traits, right? Al-mar'u ala dini khalidihi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said a man is on the behavior or the deen of his close friend, his khalil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Prophet Ibrahim as a khalil. We take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a khalil, our close, dear companion. And so therefore, we start to take on some of the qualities and traits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mercy, compassion, patience, understanding. All of these qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself with, those are the same qualities that we begin to exemplify in our behavior. If you're a king, let your behavior be royal. If you're a queen, let your behavior be royal. Character is everything, man. Islamic character is everything. So we should accept excuses. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the authentic hadith, Laysa ahadun, Laysa ahadun, ahabba ilayhi, Laysa ahadun, ahabba ilayhi al udhar min Allahi jalla wa ala min ajli dharika anzal al kitab wa arsal al rusul. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, listen to this hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there is none that loves excuses more than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ الْعُذَرَ مِنَ اللَّهِ جَلَّ وَعَلَى There is none that loves excuses more than God. Why does Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala love excuses? And he knows whether we're lying or whether we're sincere or disingenuous. But why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love excuses? I want to see who can answer this. Huh? To see if you have taqwa?
Mm, okay. Some perspective. Perspective. Somebody else says something. What do you mean? Elaborate. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves excuses because he loves to forgive. He loves to forgive. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any excuse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can extend to you some forgiveness. He wants a reason to forgive you. He wants a reason to have mercy upon you. And he created, he created us. There's an eye in the Quran. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يزالون مختلفين إلا ما رحم ربه وكذلك خلقكم وكذلك وكذلك خلقهم That people will never cease to remain مختلفين differing with one another إلا ما رحم ربه except those whom Allah has mercy upon and that is the reason that he created you. He created us to have mercy on us. He created us to have mercy on us. So why wouldn't he accept the excuse? We're sitting around as human beings trying to figure out whether or not this excuse is going to be sufficient for God, that excuse is going to be sufficient for God. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether you're honest, whether you're dishonest, whether you're genuine, you're disingenuous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking for a reason to have mercy upon you, to extend you some mercy, to extend you some compassion, to extend to you some forgiveness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Laysa ahdun ahabba ilayhi uh, al-udhar min Allahi jalla wa'ala that there's none that loves excuses more than Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala looking for a reason to have mercy on you, looking for a reason, right? While we're looking for reasons not to ask for forgiveness, right? Uh, Allah is not gonna forgive me for this. I keep committing the sin, so why am I asking Allah for forgiveness? We're looking for excuses not to ask for forgiveness. Meanwhile, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Arham al rahimin the most merciful of those who have mercy, is literally waiting for you to bring forth any excuse so he has a justification to extend to you some mercy. He has a reason to extend some mercy to you. SubhanAllah. He said, وَمِنْ أَجِلِ ذَلِكَ أَنزَلَ الْكِتَابِ وَأَرْسَلَ الرُّسُلِ and as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loving excuses, he sent down books and he sent messengers. He revealed books and he sent messengers. Why? Because by revealing books and sending messengers, this is our greatest excuse. SubhanAllah. So Sulaiman, he gives the bird instructions. He says, Idhab, we are on sword number 27, ayah 28. Turn to sword number 27, ayah 28. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that uh, Sulaiman, he says to the bird, اذهب بكتاب هذا إليهم ثم تولى عنهم فانظر ماذا يرجعون Sulaiman tells the bird, take this letter. Take this letter. He writes Bilqis a letter. This starts the conversation. Now it gets, it gets serious. Sulaiman goes and he writes Bilqis a letter. He doesn't know this queen. He doesn't know this woman. Bird observed her and her kingdom and her magnificent throne, and they were worshiping the sun. Came back and informed Sulaiman. Sulaiman goes and decides, let me write this woman a letter. It's in the Quran. Let me write this woman a letter. So he writes the woman a letter. And notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah does not mention what Sulaiman wrote. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it when Bilqis receives the letter and opens it. Then Allah exposes what he writes. Because in that moment, it's, it's like embellishing the story. It, it, it's more fodder, right? It, it's, it makes for a better storyline when Bilqis opens the letter and then reads what Sulaiman wrote. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and Sulaiman wrote Bilqis a letter and it said X, Y, Z, it doesn't really ignite a desire. There's no mystery. There's no mystery there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, he know what he, he know what he was doing. The thing is, is that while all of this is in the Quran, if you don't understand the Quran, you'll never be able to pull this out. Before reading this story, before actually acknowledging these secrets and these blessings in the Quran, to be able to approach the Quran like this. How many people read this story before, but never really read it like this? 
This is the beauty of sitting with someone, not to say me, but anybody who has formally studied Islam and has a, a formal education and can understand not just a formal education because any idiot can have a degree. I'm not talking about just simply having a degree. I'm talking about, but you can see the person with the degree that they actually know what they're talking about. They actually can convey, as I say to my students all the time, if you can't explain it, you don't understand it. If I ask you in class, what did I just say? Well, explain the concept that I just put on the board and you fumbling over your words, you don't got it. If you can't explain it, you don't understand it. And there's so many da'is, so many du'at, so many scholars, imams, preachers, teachers, some of whom may hold prestigious degrees from prestigious Islamic universities uh, all over the world. But when they come to convey the message of Islam, it's convoluted. You can barely understand what they're saying. You're either too high on the totem pole of academia and your words are so, you know, sophisticated that we got to listen to you three, four times to kind of understand what you're saying. And even then, we can't really make out what you're saying because you're so intelligent, you're so, you know, prolific with your words. You, you're just above my level. I got to go listen to somebody else. Or you're conveying your words in a way where it's just like, you know, I can't even follow you because you can't even speak in a proper, you know, proper English. You can't even give me a, a full sentence. The enunciation of your words, your sentence structure, your syntax, all of that matters to somebody who understands and values the English language. You ever listen to somebody and within the first five minutes of listening, you just turn it off. It's like, yeah, I'm good. You lost me at whatever you lost me at, you know, because I just, I can't follow. It's hard to follow, you know, and then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bless some of us with the ability to articulate in a way where you convey exactly the message that Allah wants you to convey to the very place that Allah wants you to convey it. And that is from the person's lips to your heart. That's it. That's it. From the person's lips to your heart. That's it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal right then and there what Sulaiman wrote. He reveals what Suleiman wrote when Bilqis receives the letter and then opens it and reads it. Because now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing by doing that is he's showing us emotion. He's putting us there in the moment. She opens the letter and then she calls her, you know, her counsel, you know, her scholars and everybody. And then she stands in front of everybody and she reads what Suleiman wrote. It has more of an impact. It's more effective in that manner rather than Allah saying, Suleiman grabbed the pen and wrote down this particular letter to this woman. All right? So Suleiman, he says to Al-Hudhud, the, the bird, idhab bi kitabi hadha, ilayhim. Take this letter of mine and take it to these people that you observed. Thumma tawalla anhum. Then back away from them. Fly away from a distant place so that you can see what their response is going to be. Drop the letter off and then wait, but wait at a distance where you can see them and they can't see you. And see what their response is. I want to know what their response is. This is a king talk. You don't just deliver a message and say, I said what I said, right? No, that's arrogance and that's ignorance. Because when we convey something to somebody, we want to see that they're receptive. And so therefore we convey it in a way where we are going to get the response that we're looking for. This is the art of articulation. This is the art of dialogue and communication between husband and wife, between mother and daughter, between father and son. We wanna see a reaction. We don't wanna just be dogmatic about it and say what we need to say and then walk away because I don't really care what your feelings are. I don't care what your response is. No, the whole purpose of dialogue, the whole purpose of conveying a message is to make sure that it was received. Right or wrong? That's the whole purpose that we communicate. The whole purpose of communication is to see whether or not it was received. Not to just say what I need to say because that's not a dialogue, that's a monologue. And some people, even in their marriages, they monologue, they don't dialogue. You ever talk to someone and the moment you open your mouth, they over talk you and cut you off and you just sit there like, oh, you got it all figured out. Okay. All right. 
And a lot of times, I'm being honest with you, that happens in a lot of marriages to men. The, the greatest weapon that a young man can develop as he's going into adulthood is the ability to articulate himself. Men, for to so many years, for so long, our default has always been just shut down. The wall goes up and we shut down. We hide behind the wall, right? This is men, classic. The wall goes up and we back there ducking behind the wall, hiding behind the wall. Stop hiding behind the wall. Learn how to articulate yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman Allama al-Qur'an Kharaqa al-Insan Allamahu al-Bayan Ar-Rahman The most merciful. You don't have to say nothing else. One of my favorite stories. La ilaha illallah. Hey, who just begin? Only a king can do that. Who begins a speech with just saying his name, Ar-Rahman? I don't have to say nothing else. You can stop right there. Ar-Rahman, because there's no one else on the face of the planet that is Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Nobody in creation calls themselves the most merciful, other than a king. He's the only one that can call and refer to himself as such. SubhanAllah, king's language, here again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king, king's language. Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Allam al-Qur'an, who taught the Qur'an. Khalaq al-insan, and he created the human being. Allamahu al-bayan, and he taught man the ability to articulate. The greatest weapon that a young man can arm himself with going into marriage, all of you young men that are listening, for many of you older men that have been in marriages and you've been chumped for many of years in your marriage because you simply just did not learn the art of articulation, the greatest weapon that you can supply yourself with and fortify yourself with is the ability to get your point across. That doesn't mean over talk your wife. That means communicate to your wife in a way with language that conveys exactly, number one, what you're feeling and what you expect. And a woman knows when she's in a relationship with a man who can do that. But in many instances, women can be, they're very articulate and it can be very domineering. Especially if she's a girl who was raised in a home with a bunch of women. All she has known, all she has seen in her life is women dominate men. That's all she's seen. That's, so that's all she knows. And then along comes you, Miskeen, you know, just poor little boy, you know, and you just, you want to be loved, you want to be in a relationship, you want to be respected, you know, and here come this domineering, dominating woman with this sharp tongue, right? Cut you into a million little pieces in five seconds. How do you even combat that? Usually we don't. We just put the wall up and then we duck down and hide behind the wall. Stop hiding behind the wall. Man. Learn how to articulate yourself. Learn how to get your point across. And that doesn't mean here again, over talking her or shutting her down or using Islamic phrases like obey your husband, sister, which is basically a smoke screen for shut up and, and let me dom let me steer the conversation. No, I'm talking about learning the art of articulation. Hey, honey, I love you, but we both can't talk at the same time. So how about we do this? How about I let you talk? Give her first. Why? Because you should seek first to understand before trying to be understood. Very difficult time trying to get a woman to understand that, but don't don't spin, don't rack your brain trying to get her to understand. You understand that. I'll let you talk first. I'll let you talk. I'm gonna be quiet. I'm not gonna interrupt you. I'm not gonna say anything. And then when you're done, I, allow me the opportunity to say what I need to say. And now you're listening, not for the purpose of wait until she finished so I can cut in. No, you're listening attentively. You're listening because you wanna pay attention to what she's saying so that you can understand her. Listen to understand, not to respond. And then once she's done, you give her the confirmation that she needs. You have been heard, babe. Right? So let me reiterate to you what I heard you say. So you're saying X, Y, Z, correct? And she says, yes, that's correct. Okay, I got it. As the Arabs say, I got you. I heard you. You have been heard. Can I, can I say what I need to say now? Sure, floor is yours. That's the way that a dialogue works. 
He said, I understood you. He didn't say, I agree with you. He said, I understand you. Let me reiterate back to you what I heard. What I heard you say was X, Y, Z. Am I correct? And she might say, no, that's not what I mean. Okay, say it again so I can understand what you're saying. I'm saying X, Y, Z. Okay, let me make sure I got you. So you're saying X, Y, Z. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, I got you. I heard you. Loud and clear. I heard you. Okay, now can I say what I need to say? Sure, go ahead. Wallahi, if we follow that, we could reduce a lot of the unnecessary friction that goes on in many of our households. We could reduce a lot of the unnecessary friction, tension that goes on between husband and wife and households. But it's all about gaining the tools. It's all about learning the tools. The same stuff that most of us got from home. I didn't get it from my home, but I had to do research. I had to sit in classes. I had to do this. I had to gather information. I had to go through it myself. And then when we package that up and we're ready to deliver that to the community, it seemed like the only time that we want to listen is when we are in dire straits, when our marriage is on, you know, on the brink of divorce. Then it's like we're running to the imam or running to the, the scholars and asking for all types of assistance. And it's just like, why didn't you come to me six months ago? I can't save your marriage now. It's too much water under the bridge. I wish you would have reached out to me months ago. But a lot of times for the men, they don't reach out because I don't want no, another man in my business. I don't want another man telling me what I'm doing wrong. It's like, yeah, but even a doctor needs a doctor, genius. Doctor doesn't administer, you know, his practice on himself. He goes to a doctor. Even a doctor needs a doctor. And you can learn some of those tools, uh, shameless plug, you can learn some of those tools in my course uh, titled The Divorce Remedy, <laughs> which I'll be running the course after Ramadan, inshallah, ta'ala. The Divorce Remedy. You've seen me advertise for this course before. Anybody listening who has taken that course knows the tools that I have given out during that course. It's a five-week course. $250 is a small drop in a bucket for the amount of tools that you're going to get to save your marriage. I believe that saving a marriage is priceless and you can't put a price tag on that, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. It all depends on how much you value your marriage. If you value your marriage then you'll be willing to invest whatever it takes. If it ain't that much, it's just like 250. Yeah. I had to let this one go. You know, I'll say, I'll save the next one. You know, it all depends on how you value your marriage. It's on you. I'll save the next one. All right. So he says to the bird, take my, take this uh, letter to Bilqis, take this letter to them and drop it off, but then stand back and see what the response is going to be. So the Hupi takes the bird, uh, he takes the letter to Seba, to Yemen of Ma'rib, and Bilqis is in, in her home. She has a niche in her room. Uh, in her castle that has a window in it where she can see the sun rising. And she positions her window where the sun rises. Why? For the obvious. So she can worship the sun when the sun is rising. Right, exactly. So the hoopy comes to the window and sets the letter, flew to the edge of the window and sets the letter on, placed the letter on the edge of the window and then flew to a nearby place so he could observe her response, just as he was commanded by Suleiman. So when she saw this uh, letter, uh, and during that time, kings or people of prestige, they used to put something on the letter that would make the letter, let the recipient of the letter know that it came from someone of prestige. What was it? Huh? A seal, yes. That's how you know. What was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seal? He couldn't write. He couldn't read or write. What was his seal? He used to wear a ring on his finger that said Muhammad Rasul Allah. And he used to dip it in the ink and then he would use that to, to seal his letters. Or they would roll it up, if it was parchment paper, they would roll it up into a scroll and then 
take it, dip it, and put the seal on it. And that seal would close the letter, the flap of the letter. All right, and it would be delivered. And that's the way when that delivery came, the person would look at the seal. And the seal would determine the prestige of the person that was sending it. So if it was a gold seal on it, or if it was a seal that had, you know, some type of emblem or something on it. And this is where a lot of the, um, in, in our day, in our society today, where these, um, you know, uh, images, you know, if you look at universities, they all have, you know, mascots, they have these, you know, images, what do they call them? What, what is the word I'm looking for? Logos, you know, all, every, all of them have this. And if you think about it, when you look at universities and things like that, those logos, those images, those um, icons, those things go back generations. 1700s, 1600s, 1500s. Um, and a lot of times they go back to Europe, obviously. Um, and a lot of times they go back to tribes and you know different you know people of status and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history to that. So he brings the letter and puts the letter on the window seal. The letter has a seal on it. And he flew away to a nearby place so that he could observe her response. When she saw the seal on the letter, she knew it was from a king or a man of great magnificent status and prestige. Right? She saw the seal on it. So whatever seal Suleiman used for the letter was an indication that this was not a letter from an ordinary guy. All right. And she opens the seal and begins to read the letter, right? She opens the seal and she begins to read the letter. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that you can tell the prestige of a letter by the seal. The prestige of the letter is determined by the seal. And that's the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after reading the letter, she calls, you know, all of her generals, she assembles her army, her generals, her chiefs. Um, she has in, in a huge army, over 100,000 fighters under, her, uh, under their command. So she has chiefs. And then under each chief, they have, you know, fighters. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, that Bilqis, she had 100,000 chiefs. And under each chief, she had 100,000 fighters. That's how huge her army was. That's how huge her army was. And if you think about it, I'm not going to give it away. I want to see if you can catch this. So Suleiman sent a bird with a letter. In our modern day times, that would be considered a what? Huh? A what? Well, yeah, that, that would be a drone. Yeah. That's, you're a millennial, so I, yeah. I, I would expect that from you. A, a drone. Yeah. Go back a little bit before the drones. <laughs> what would that be considered? Something on social media with a bird. A tweet. I guess I'm I'm old and corny. My 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 children will be like, oh gosh. Stop it. Just stop. 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 You're killing us right now. Right. So yeah, it would be considered a tweet. Because a bird is carrying a message. This would be considered the first tweet. Right? Or the first email, because this was him sending a letter, a message to somebody else. So, yeah, I uh, just thought that I would mention that. I know it's corny, it's lame. Uh, somebody said, stop it. Just stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. I never thought, I always thought I was cool, right? And I never thought that I would become that father that your kids look at and be like, shh. You are embarrassing. I never thought I would be that guy, man, but I am that guy. Alhamdulillah, I'm grateful for being that guy because there's a lot of people who came from where I came from that never made it to that. So I'm grateful. I'll be, I'll, I can be corny all day long and I'm, I'm okay with that. So this is lesson number 21. And that is that sometimes correspondence with letters uh, can be a very effective way of giving da'wah. All right. This is one of the ways of giving da'wah. So if you look at Suleiman, he, you know, he was now setting a precedent of conveying the message of Islam through writing. Right. And he's the first prophet that I know of that conveyed 
the message of Tawheed through writing. And this was something that the Prophet Sallallahu followed this uh, methodology. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent letters to many kings inviting them to Islam, he sent letters to the Byzantine Emperor uh, Heraclius. Um, he sent, you know, the letter to the Persian king, the ruler of Bahrain, the king of Yemen, and the leader of the tribe of Ghassan in, in the area of Syria, the king of uh, the ruler of Egypt, Makukas. He sent letters to all of these people inviting them to Islam. And some of them responded positively, like uh, Makukas, the ruler of Egypt, uh, as well as um, uh, Najashi, the, the ruler of Ethiopia, the, what we know today as modern day Ethiopia was Abyssinia during that time. Abyssinia, I mean, uh, Najashi actually converted to Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu actually prayed Janazah over him in Medina. And this was known as Salatul Ghaib, the prayer over the person whose body is not actually present. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu did that over Najashi. Hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. So some of these kings actually responded to the Prophet Sallallahu Dawah. And some of them rejected it. All right? Nonetheless, this is one of the ways, you know, correspondence, you know, one of the most effective ways to... Um, to give dawah, sometimes it's to send a letter, right? Guys in prison do it all the time, right? They go to jail, they convert to Islam, and they're giving dawah to everybody, which is it's admirable. It's admirable to see, you know, them sitting there writing letters to friends and family members, girlfriends, or whoever, and they call literally calling them to Islam. And you can see the ripple effect of that in the women who come to the imam and say, you know, is it permissible for me to marry this brother in prison? She wants to marry a guy in jail. Why? Because the guy is giving her dawah. God's telling her about Islam. You understand? Here he is behind a wall, serving X amount of years that he's serving, but yet he is corresponding with somebody on the other side of the wall about Islam and prompts that person to go and take their shahada. It's very profound. I'm just trying to give us another way of looking at it rather than, you know, the normal way we see it, which is, you know, him looking for a prison buddy to do his bid with him, you know, and then he comes home and, you know, messes around with a friend, you know which usually happens as well. But I'm trying to show you the, 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 the beauty of that, the beauty of that side, the beautiful side of that. And that is that through correspondence, these brothers are in prison, literally giving people dawah, giving people dawah and people have accepted Islam. Many of the women who are women in the Muslim community right now, if I was to ask right now, how many sisters right now that are listening online by raising your hand, took your shahada, accepted Islam because a brother, somebody that you knew, friend, family member, boyfriend, whoever, was in prison and communicating to you about Islam. And you were sitting there, couldn't wait to get that letter in the mail. You got that letter, you got home, you sat down with your coffee, your tea, or if you was a non-Muslim, you had a glass of wine or whatever, and you wanted to read that letter. And you know, he ain't got nothing but time, so the letter's folded up, it's like 10 pieces of paper in the letter. And you loving every single page of it. Facts. Absolutely, that the Bismillah in Arabic on the top, everything, the date, he <laughs> put the date on there, you know. Absolutely, he took his time with that. And you were looking forward, you got home from work, you checked your mail, right? And checking your mail was the dopamine, the burst of dopamine that you got when you were checking your mail, hoping that there would be a letter in there. That's the same burst of dopamine we get now when we post something on social media and then we go back and see if somebody commented, how many people liked it, right? That's the dopamine, you know, that feel good drug, that chemical in our body that makes us feel good when we anticipate something that we are looking, you know, that we're looking forward to. And you get home and you sit down and you read in that letter and letter after letter and the page, you flip in the page, you might even read it twice. You know, but the fact of the matter is that he's giving you dawah. You, you accepted Islam. Many women right now in our communities right now are right. So I'm so looking forward to the letter <laughs> the bird sent me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hilarious. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to the letter the bird sent. <laughs> Right, the bird, the jailbird, you see the connection. <laughs> that was too easy. <laughs> that was too easy. But no, shout out to the brothers, man, subhanAllah, behind the wall, 
uh, that are, you know, practicing Islam right now, they're, they're fasting, they're, you know, they're, you know, you know, watching, you know, other inmates in, in the jail system that are going to lunch and breakfast and things like that. And, you know, many of the prisons, they do accommodate, you know, a lot of the brothers that are behind the wall, they accommodate them by, you know, putting their breakfast and lunch together. And, you know, sometimes they'll even have the, you know, the, the chef or whatever, or they'll let the brothers go in the kitchen and, you know, commandeer the kitchen and make whatever they're going to make for. And it, it's really, it's a really interesting experience. Um, but right now they are fasting and they are, you know, they are practicing Islam and they're giving dawah. They're giving dawah to the brothers that are in prison, you know? So you got to look at how communication and correspondence, you know, you know, the, Right. <laughs> Somebody said, where would you be without the Garden State Youth Correctional Facility? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, but given Dawa, and there are a lot of people in our communities that would not be Muslim today had it not been for those brothers taking the time out of their lives, writing these letters and sending these letters home to their family members, friends. And, you know, and these people are converting to Islam as a result of that. It's a very powerful form. And I mean, I'm showing you how powerful it is that somebody can be hundreds hundreds of miles away in a facility locked in and through sitting in his room writing a letter and folding it up putting it into an envelope and mailing it out that that transaction of him putting this information on paper putting it in an envelope and shipping it out to someone and the person receiving it and being affected by those words and prompting them to take shahada that is powerful man that is a very powerful exchange and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used, you know, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this uh, on many occasions and continues to use it to guide people to Islam. All right. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent out letters to many of the kings and he got positive responses from a lot of a lot of people. But wasail da'wiya, you know, the methods of giving da'wah are many, and we should take advantage of them all in order to convey the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one of the most effective ways is through written correspondence. Also, lesson number 22 in this is the adab, the manners that one should exhibit with those that are in authority. And that is to give them room or space to read something that is important. Right. And to observe their actions without interrupting them. That's what Sudan men instructed the bird. Drop the letter and back away and observe. Right. You ever have like sometimes as a teacher, I'm, I'm great in papers and then I have a student standing over behind, like get from behind me. You know, you're standing here while I'm trying to grade papers, you know, being nosy or I'm in my phone and one of my kids walk over here, you know, looking down at my phone. Why are you, why are you looking at my phone? Give me some space. So, you know, it's the adab of giving the person their space to, you know, read and to, and, and to observe their behavior without interrupting them. All right. And these are the manners that we should teach our children. Very important to respect the privacy of others. So Suleiman, he told the bird, drop the, drop the letter and then back away, but observe the behavior so that you can come back to me and let me know what the response was. All right. But that's adab. That's teaching them adab. So after gathering her generals, and her soldiers and her chiefs and her council, she finally discloses to them who the letter is from and what the contents of the letter are. Listen to the words. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now exposes what Suleiman wrote. All right. So, so Bill Qis, she says, Qalat ya ayyuhal mala'u. She said, Oh generals, oh chief, oh, you know, my people, inni ulqiya ilayya kitabun kareem that I have been given a very noble, a very noble and uh, prestigious letter. Innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bi bismil, bi innahu bismillahi rahman rahim That the letter is from Sulaiman and the letter begin with bismillahi rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Allah Don't be arrogant towards me. What to me Muslimin, but come to me as Muslim. King's language. He ain't debating with you about you worshiping the sun. Hey, why y'all over there worshiping the sun? I ain't debating with you about worshiping the sun. Don't be arrogant. Come to me as Muslims. King's language. We'll unpack that. First thing that you notice is that she described the letter as noble, kareem, 
because it was from a wise king. She could look when she opened the letter, she could look at the seal and tell it that it was from somebody important. And then when she opened it and read the content, she could see that it was very succinct, very concise, very to the point. And this is here again, king's language. A man who conducts himself like a king is not gonna do a whole bunch of explaining himself, right? As the older you get as a man, the less energy you have to explain yourself. You ever found yourself as a man telling somebody, man, I'm not, I'm not going to do a whole bunch of explaining to you, man. I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, I already said what I needed to say to you. I'm not going to do a whole bunch of explaining because when you go back and you, and this goes for women and two, especially when you're dealing with men, when you explain yourself too much, it, it sends the message that you're not actually confident about what you're trying to convey. You ever say something and then you double back and you just want to explain yourself to the person, you think that you're giving further elucidation of what you're trying to convey, but what the way the person is receiving that is that you're not actually confident in what you're saying. You have to know how to say no, and that's it. Sometimes a no is a no. I don't owe you an explanation. No is powerful. It's a very powerful word. Learn the art of no. No is very powerful. To say less is powerful because it leaves mystery. It leaves a person wondering, you know, well, you only said a few sentences and that's that. Is, is something else you want? No, I said what I needed to say. Right? In this day and time, we do too much talking. We talk entirely too much and we don't leave any mystery. This is especially true for women. When you get angry, get upset, oh, you just, you run it off, boom, boom. And first of all, and second of all, and, and thirdly, and you're gonna, you're gonna itemize everything. What if I told you less is more? The less you say, the more you're saying. How about that? The less you say, the more you say. And the more you say, the less you're actually saying. You, 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 got, you got me? You guys follow me? You understand what that means, right? Just, I need, I need to know, not that, that I'm doubting your competence. Uh, sometimes I just need a pulse. You know, I need a pulse. Sometimes I see something, I'm looking at facial expressions and they're like, I'm just like, are they getting this? Like, is, is it registering? That's why arguments never go anywhere. Right. Less is more. The less you say, the more you're actually saying. Because when you when you lessen the amount of words that come out of your mouth, it leaves people that you're talking to it puts the responsibility on them to listen to your words and to pay attention to what you're saying. And the more you explain yourself, the more a person can sift through what you're saying and play around with your words. You ever have somebody that, a narcissist, they do that all the time, they're famous for it. They play with your words. Well, like, listen, I'm not gonna play semantics with you. You, you heard what I said. I said, this is what I said. Well, what do you mean by that, man? Listen, al maruf la yu'arraf. What's understood doesn't have to be explained all day long. And this is the way you keep people off of you. You back them off of you. The more you start to explain yourself, and then you give people, you welcoming them in with their semantics to play with your words, to play around with what you're saying, to add and subtract, and and then here you go. They unspun, they spun, they spun you, and you sitting there trying to figure out like. Well, I went into this thinking I was just going to say this, and this person just took me halfway around the world. Well, you set yourself up for that. You welcome that in because the more you try to explain yourself, the more you're giving the person leverage to play with your words. The Arabs, they have a saying, the best speech is what is short and to the point. The best speech is what is straight, short, and straight to the point. I'll have a whole bunch of long, drawn-out comments or speeches. I, I, I'm very short. I'm very to the point. All right? So after she read the letter and understood the assignment, right, she described the letter as noble, a noble letter because it was from a wise king who wrote it in such an articulate and mannerable way and succinct way that it contained guidance and a beautiful invitation to Tawheed. And it was sealed. As the Prophet said, Karamat al-Kitab khatamuhu. 
that the nobility of a letter is distinguished by its khatam, by its seal, right? So the distinction of a letter is determined by the seal that is used to close it. When you look at the seal, you know that this is coming from somebody important. All right, this is why in today's time, when businesses want to send a letter out, what do we use? A letterhead. We use a letterhead. When it comes from when it comes from a business professionally, it, it's a letterhead. That's the seal, modern day seal. Because when you open up the email, you see from this and you see the, the company logo and everything, you know that it's from somebody professional, from a president, CEO, or somebody in a position, you know, to be able to communicate with you in a way that lets you know that this is important. So, and because it began with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most gracious, most merciful, keep in mind, this woman has never received a message like this. This is Suleiman, the king. Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins his letter, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It began with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the most gracious, most merciful. All right? And this brings me to lesson number 23, and that is that anything that does not begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that does not have any barakah in it. And this is also one of the ways that you know if it's something that's halal or haram. If you can't say bismillah before you do it, nine times out of ten, it's haram. You're going to go meet up with the sister. Can you say bismillah when you get in the car, put your keys in the ignition, and you head it over to wherever you headed over to meet the sister? Or vice versa, you're going to meet with the brother. If you can't say bismillah before you do it, nine times out of ten, it's haram. It's haram. So that can, we can use that as a gauge. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, بِالٍ لَا يُبْدَأْ فِيهِ بِبِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ فَهُوَ أَجْذَمْ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ فَهُوَ أَبْتَرْ أَوْ أَقْطَعْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any speech, any speech or any affair that is of importance, that does is not begin, does not begin with in the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful, then it is void of barakah. This is why when we start the khutbah, we begin in the alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, nasta'inuhu, wa nastaghfiru. Right? We begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but we begin surely with the name of Allah. If I grab the microphone, the Imam grabs the microphone. First. first thing we say, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulillah. We begin with the name of Allah even before I say what I need to say. Even if I'm just asking somebody, hey, come move your car. I don't say, hey, anybody got a car? Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Does anybody have a car over here that, you know, we begin the even the smallest, most insignificant of speech with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because but by beginning with the name of Allah, we are invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his barakah and whatever is about to come out of our mouths. You can use this as husband and wives in your home before you begin a conversation. Bismillah. Bismillah. I need the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I begin this conversation. Or alhamdulillah. All right? But any affair that does not begin with the name of Allah, does not begin with ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then it is abtar aqta' ajdam that it is void of any barakah. And this hadith was collected in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed and was graded as Hassan. It was graded Hassan, a degree right, a, a degree beneath Sahih. It was graded Hassan by Imam al nawawi as well as Ibn Hajar uh, al-Asqalani, rahimahumullah ta'ala. The scholars, they say, let me ask, how many Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, what is called al-Basmala? Al-Basmala is the word for it. How many Basmalas are there in the Quran? 113. Very good. That means that there is one surah in the Quran that does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What surah is that? Surah At-Tawbah, surah number nine. Why does surah number nine not have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with it? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin every single surah in the Quran with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with the exception of surah At-Tawbah, surah number nine? Scholars have a number of reasons that they say that this is. Number one is because they say that Surah Tawbah is an extension of Surah Anfal, which is the Surah right before it. 
So although a separate surah, it is an annex, it is a continuation of that surah that is before it. Number two, the scholars say that the reason why Surah Tatoba does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is because it's about war, right, Amir? Uh, Surah Tatoba is about fighting, about war, battle, and that is not a place for mercy. So Allah removed Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from that surah because that surah is about fighting, bloodshed, war, battle, and that is not the place for mercy. All right. However, the scholars say that the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that Suleiman begin his letter with is the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that is missing from Surah Tawbah. So there's actually 114 Bismillahs in the Quran. So for those of you who said 113, there's your correction. So there's actually 114 Bismillahs in the Quran. The one from Surah Tawbah is actually mentioned in Surah Naml, Surah number 27, uh, in the letter of uh, Sulaiman. Okay? So there are actually 114. So she knew at that moment when she opened the letter and she seen Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, when she saw that, and, and let's, let me clarify this because I, I made a note in my notes to make sure that we clarify this. A lot of, especially for those of us that are African-Americans and Arabic is not our original language and we acquire the Arabic language, but even in acquiring the Arabic language, sometimes we don't understand the rules of Arabic. And so even though we are saying words in Arabic, we are pronouncing them incorrectly. When we pronounce Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah's name, Lafqul Jalala, is Allah and it's Mufakham in the Arabic language, which means that it comes off hard. Allah, right? However, if there's a kasra before Allah's name, then it goes from being mufakham to muraqqaq. It, be, it becomes soft. So instead of Allah, it becomes la. So when Allah says, lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al There's a kasra before Allah's name. Allah is saying, to Allah belongs what is in the heavens and the earth. So this is why we say la instead of Allah. Lillahi ma fi samawati wal ard. Tayyib. When you look at Bismillah, there's a kasra before Allah's name. Bis. There's a ba with a kasra on it, which means in or with. Ismillah. Ism means name. Right? B and then ism. Bismi. Bismi. The meme has a kasra on it. That is before Allah's name. So we said before, when a kasra comes before Allah's name, it goes from being Allah to la. Bismillah. So don't say Bismi Allah. It's not Bismi Allah. It's a hum, don't say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Because Alhamdulillah. There's a kasra before Allah's name. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Not Alhamdulillah, right? For a lot of our old heads. You know, alhamdulillah, we, we respect you, we love you, but a lot of uh, the a lot of the Islam that many of our parents and grandparents were learning uh, back in the day did not necessarily involve, you know, the proper enunciation and pronunciation of Arabic words. They were just happy to be Muslim. You know, they were practicing Islam to the best of their ability, uh, probably more so than what many of us are doing today with little knowledge. Meanwhile, we had the information highway of Islam right at our fingertips. And many of us are still ignorant as they come. All right. So just, you know, so that we, you know, we correct, you know, so we correct things here again. We still break in generational curses. All right. So it's not Alhamdulillah. It's Alhamdulillah. Now, you know why? And then Bismi, not Bismi Allah. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. So, uh, she knew at that moment that the letter was from Suleiman and that he was a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But notice, although he was a king, he did not invite her to his kingdom. And this is the last point I'm going to end before we end here. I think it's just very important to understand. He said, what was his words? His first words, he said, Innahu min Suleiman, innahu bi bismillahir rahim. Another point here 
is that is that he stated he was very transparent about who the letter was from. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to say this, you know, to let I, I want this to sink in with all of those who are listening. For all of you who have a ghost account. All of you who have a ghost account, meaning you have an account on Instagram or Facebook that is under a name that is not yours. And you use that to go follow somebody that either you probably shouldn't be following or um, probably don't want you to follow because if they found out it was you, they would probably block you or just spying on someone because you want to be, you know, clandestine. You want to be hidden. You don't want the person to know that you're following them. If you can't use your name and follow somebody, like be honorable about how you do things. I don't own a ghost account, period. You ain't ever got to worry about, oh, that's probably should be Muhammad following my account. No, it's not. I promise you, it's not. Number one, I don't use social media for that. Social media is not entertainment for me. It's education for me. We, we, we are different. We're different when it comes to social media. I'm not using social media for that. But for those who have ghost accounts, be transparent. If you can't use your name and the person that you're following, you know, if they care to even know that you're there, like, I mean, the person got, you know, 30,000 followers, 100,000 followers, you a new follower, what do you care? You think he's going through 100,000 people to see who's following them? Like, they don't care. Maybe somebody else who's looking to find your fault or your mistake is, but the person who owns the account, he could care less, she could care less. But if you can't follow somebody being transparent about who you are, then you probably don't need to follow them. You probably don't need to follow them. That should be an indicator, clear sign that you probably don't need to follow them. I would like to think it is haram for you to have a ghost account because it's what's called ghish, it's deception. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day, let me share this with you. One day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he walked past a, a, a fruit stand and the owner of the fruit stand was selling fruit. But when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at the fruit, he saw all the fruit on the top was so perfect. The whole barrel of fruit can't be perfect. Like we're farmers, this is natural, organic. You know, the tree doesn't produce all perfect apples. You understand? Like there's going to be some that a worm got in. There's going to be some that, you know, is, is not right. Some that's overripe. But, you know, like nobody has a perfect row of apples on the top. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked by, um, walked by the, the apple stand, he saw all the perfect apples lined up on top. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stuck his hand down into the barrel and he felt that the fruit on the bottom of the barrel was spoiled. So basically the guy selling a barrel of fruit is selling it to you because you're buying based upon what's on the top. So you look at the top layer of fruit and you're like, oh, all of the fruit must look like that. You pay your money and you walk off with the basket of fruit. You get home only to remove the top layer to find out everything underneath it is spoiled. This was called rish, deception. So the Prophet ﷺ stuck his hand down in the barrel and he felt that the fruit on the bottom was spoiled. And he told the, the owner of the fruit stand, he said, He said, why don't you put the spoiled fruit on the top with everything so that everybody can see what they're purchasing? He who deceives us is not of us. It's not the behavior of a Muslim. It's not the behavior of someone who claims to be a follower of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm just stating this, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you guys can do whatever you want to do. You have to answer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for what you do. I have to answer for what I do. But my job is to clarify what is halal, what is haram to our ummah so that, you know, we, we know Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said that he will never punish a people until at first he makes it clear that you don't value what you should stay away from. That Allah will not punish a people until at first he clarifies to them what they should stay away from. And then when we don't value that and we continue to indulge, then we deserve whatever we get. Whether as a people or collectively or individually. But, um, you know, I mean, if you can't use your name and follow somebody and do it in an honorable way, then you probably shouldn't be following the person to begin with. But Suleiman was very transparent. He said, Innahu min Suleyman. This letter is from Suleyman. Very clear about who it's coming from. 
rahim and indeed it is in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Allah ta'lu alayya don't become arrogant with me don't be arrogant with me what to ni muslimin but come to me as Muslims submitting yourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that leaves us at our last lesson for today and that's lesson number 4 24 and that is that Suleiman he called Bilqis to the kingdom of Allah and did not call her to his own kingdom man I can I, we don't got enough time for me to go into this but men need to understand men if you're giving women dawa you're giving a woman dawa right for men I want you to listen because you have a lot of brothers oh I'm giving the sister dawa call the sister to Allah's kingdom not your kingdom call the sister to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to worship you call the sister to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to serve you call the sister to devote her life to Allah not to devote her life to you call the sister for her to sacrifice herself for Allah not to sacrifice herself for you Suleiman is a king has a huge kingdom has all of you know these things that Allah gave him and with all of that kingdom he still calls the woman to the king Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom he serves not calling the woman to himself it's not a da'wah ila nafs. I'm not giving you da'wah because I want you to follow me, worship me. Call the woman to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, the surah number 12, ayah 108. Kul hadihi sabili. Say, O Muhammad. Say, O Muhammad, hadihi sabili. This is my path. I call to Allah. Ad'u ilallah. I call to Allah. Not to myself. Not to following me. I call to Allah. Ala basira. Upon clarity. Me and those who follow me. If you are a follower of Prophet Muhammad, you're not calling to your masjid. You're not calling to a particular scholar. We have brothers, man, subhanAllah, for the life of me, can't understand it. You call to a scholar that is doesn't speak your language, wouldn't know your environment, doesn't, doesn't understand anything about you or your environment, probably wouldn't even know who you were if you were standing in front of them. But you got brothers out here talking about, oh, we follow the scholars. We take from the scholars. We got to go back to the uli map. You go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says that if you differ in anything, if you differ in anything, you take it back to Allah and his messenger, not back to the scholars. We don't worship scholars. We respect them. We honor them as much as their position will allow us to. But we go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we lost that. We lost that protocol, lost protocols of the Muslim religion. That makes for a great book. But the fact of the matter is that these are protocols that we have lost touch with. I don't call to scholars. Oh, we call to following the scholars. Following what scholars? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Say, O Muhammad, this is my path. I call to Allah upon clarity. Me and those who follow. We don't call to scholars. We don't call to personalities. We don't call to a masjid. Oh, you got to attend this masjid. This is the masjid that's on the haq. This is the masjid that's on the truth. You got to follow this masjid. You got to follow this imam. We don't call to an imam. We don't call to a particular masjid. We don't call to a particular uh, um, uh, medheb. Oh, you got to be Hanbali. You got to be Sunni. You got to be Salafi. You got to be this. We call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his book and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah. That's it. That's it. You want to call me Salafi? You can call me whatever you want to call me. I call myself a Muslim who follows the Quran and the Sunnah based upon the understanding of the first three generations of Islam. That's it. You want to call that Salafi? Call it Salafi. That's not what I call it. I call it being a Muslim because that's the only thing that we should follow. That's the only thing all Muslims should follow. Period. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But when we get to these labels, these names, and following this sheikh, or following this masjid, or following this imam, or whatever the case, my imam is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't, I don't have another imam. Yes, I have an imam of my local masjid, right, who takes on the task of leading the community, 
But that's with condition that he follows the Quran and the Sunnah too. He is not above that. He is not, nobody is above that. Scholars included, they're not above following the Quran and the Sunnah. A scholar can't say something and not give you any evidence or delil from the Quran and the Sunnah. Since when? We have now removed the Quran and the Sunnah, and now the scholar becomes the end all be all of our religion? Well, the Sheikh said it. Well, where did the Sheikh get it from? What ayah did the Sheikh quote? What hadith? Oh, you know more than the Sheikh? No, but I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion, and I know the foundational principle of our religion is follow the Quran and follow the Sunnah. I do know that. Don't pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> got to be kidding me don't urinate on my head and tell me it's raining like you you oh you you think you know more than the scholars no i don't know more than the scholars got it they're scholars great but scholars still have to follow what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said because above everyone that has knowledge is someone more knowledgeable you want to shame me for not being as knowledgeable as the imam or knowledgeable as the sheikh the sheikh is not as knowledgeable as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nobody is above allah and above everyone that has knowledge is one more knowledgeable Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's some people that's not going to like that, but hey, get in line. There's a whole bunch of people that don't like me. That's okay. It's fine. I can live with that. I'm not going to lose one eye order to sleep, I promise you. But what I will not do is stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having known the truth and was afraid to say it. That's what I, I will not do that. That's what I will not do. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I mean, it's just so pro profound. He said, come to me as Muslims, submitting yourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He called them, he called Bilqis to Allah, not to himself. And I think sometimes as Muslim men, we get it twisted. We start to see ourselves as, you know, I'm that guy, I'm that dude. I got the hen in my beard. I got the prostration mark. I got the high throw. I'm that dude. I'm that guy. I'm giving this woman da'wah. You calling her to you. Because she's accepting Islam because she want to be with you. Remove yourself from the equation. Tell her that marrying you is a plus. That's, that's the icing on the cake. But you're accepting Islam for Allah, not for me. For us to get married, that's icing on the cake. But you convert into Islam, that's for you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not for me. Because what happens is she converts to Islam for you. When you divorce her and you leave her, she leaves Islam. That means that she was only Muslim for you. She was only Muslim for you, which is why the Prophet, why Abu Bakr said to the believers when the Prophet died, whoever used to worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. Meaning if you was in this for Muhammad, the personality of Muhammad, then your mission is over. Go, go about your business, leave Islam. Because Muhammad is dead. But whoever worships Allah, Allah is ever living and he never dies. Meaning your mission will continue on until you die. That's the same message that we want to convey to the women when we're giving them da'wah. Brothers, be careful. Don't call the woman to your kingdom. Call the woman to the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هذا وصل الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين Again, there will be no class tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, but we will come back. We will resume on Thursday بإذن الله. جزاكم الله خيرا وصل الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما وسبحانك ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين